Good, beautiful morning, everyone. I am just tickled to death. So thrilled to see all of you here. Um, I believe we have an extraordinary day in store, and I can't even begin to thank you enough for your interest in this community, or your passion for this community, and the fact that you'd be willing to come inside and spend a few hours talking about our future um, on such a beautiful day. So thank you so very, very much. My name is Jonathan Schechter. I'm the executive director of the Chartour Institute. And this is our, depending on how you count COVID, either our ninth or 11th annual uh, 22 and 21 conference. 22, County 22 and 21 in the 21st century. And so the purpose of this conference is to take a look at some of the deepest, most complex issues facing us as a community. And when I say community, I'm talking about the one community spanning two states and at least three counties that has become the greater Tetons area. And so what I thought I would do this morning is run you through a little a brief under, uh, explanation of what you have in store for the day. And then we will go on uh, and talk a little bit among ourselves to try and, because really the point of all this is to find your ideas and get your energy and thoughts going toward helping make ours a better place, to leaving a better community than the one we found. So with that, um, I want to start first and foremost with thank yous. Uh, my first and, and most important thank you is to Merrill Private Wealth Management. Um, our primary sponsor, and Phil Hartle, where are you, Phil? Please stand up. So uh, I got to know Phil a couple of years ago, and as he came to town to uh, explore our community, and Phil has become a very generous uh, supporter of things in Jackson Hole, and Phil, I can't thank you enough. And for those of you who were, um, it was, I know it was important to all of us that we get a good cross-section, even of some of the organizations that couldn't necessarily afford this. So thanks to your beneficence, um, we got a really nice turnout of our community. So thank you very much, Phil. I would also be remiss if I didn't note the great support. Lori, thank you for the help of the Community Foundation. And for each of the last eight uh, 22 and 21s, we've been lucky enough to get support from St. John's Health. So the whole team, I, I'm beyond words of grateful. Thanks. So thank you very much. Um, there are also some elected officials uh, in the room. And one of the problems with getting older and not getting much sleep the last couple nights is I can't see for a damn. Uh, so if you're an elected official, would you please stand up just so we can acknowledge your presence? Because the service you give to the community is just tremendous. And again, my deepest thanks to all of you. It's, it's just, it means the world that you care this much about this community to show up for this event. A um, few housekeeping chores. So food, as you've probably discovered by now, there'll be coffee, tea, uh, and the like in the back all day. We'll have lunch around 12, 15. There'll be a buffet if you move through it and then come back in. Um, and then around 2 o'clock, we'll have a snack. Uh, Josh Griffith, Storyboard Productions, is filming this. So uh, we will be posting the videos. What do you think, Josh? A week or so? Yeah. yeah. So about a week or so, we will be posting videos of all the speakers. And there were some people who couldn't make it. Unfortunately, uh, it seems like there's a bit of a wave of COVID going through the community. So that I, some people told me that they couldn't make it. But anyway, I will let you know when um, the videos are posted. Uh, Similarly, I will reach out to you via email after the session for evaluations. Those are tremendously important to us. And just to give you a sense of the lay of the day, we're going to have a series of questions and answers with three different groups. One looking at the environment, one looking at community, one looking at the, um, at the economy. And each of the speakers will go. Then afterward, there'll be a q and A. I'll start off by asking each of the speakers just what did you hear from your colleagues that really struck you? But then it becomes interactive. So that's just going to be the general focus of the day. Two other quick housekeeping things. Uh, one is, unfortunately, those who are being hit by illness, uh, one of them is Mayor Haley Morton Levinson. So unfortunately, she won't be able to join us today. So that leaves a hole in the community thing. Um, and she can, 
she's not only sick herself, but she's got two sick kids. So it's a when it rains, it pours kind of thing, unfortunately. And the other is, you may be wondering about those stickers on your table. Uh, Yvonne Chouinard is uh, one of the advisory board members of the Chartour Institute. And uh, last year, I, as a way of saying thank you for all he's done, I got these stickers made up and just gave them away. And then, uh, as many of you probably know, he converted Patagonia into a, he divested himself of Patagonia and gave it to environmental causes. And so I got a lot of requests for uh, more stickers. So if those stickers seem to strike you, please, please help yourselves to them. That's the goal, it's just, it's my way of honoring my friend Yvonne. Um, setting expectations. The immodestly named Schechter's equation for life, satisfaction equals reality minus expectations. And the reason I mention that right now is because I want to make sure people's expectations for the day are calibrated properly. And what I see today is being is the first step on a journey toward the future. The goal of today is beginning a dialogue. It's not trying to come to any big conclusions. We, I believe, as a community are at a crossroads. As I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, I think we're going through some growth and change that's pretty much unprecedented in the community's history. And the question is how we're going to navigate that. I, th I think this, there's a, a certain unease that is in the bones and, and sinews of all of us. Um, and the question is, how are we going to deal with that? And that's really the big question that we're facing. And so it's not going to be an easy process. It's not going to be a um, linear process. There'll be ups and downs. But I, I believe, and I think all of you do too, that it's so very worth it because this community, this region is worth it. So. Like I say, in terms of calibrating your expectations, I think we're gonna get a lot done today, but I see it as a first step and nothing is not as a final product. So, the day is basically going to be bro broken into three parts. I'm gonna make a couple of opening remarks. Then we as tables are going to sit down, perhaps where there are only two of you, you could join another table. Um, but the, the idea is to spend about half an hour um, talking amongst ourselves about how we envision the future. So that's part one, get the juices flowing. Part two will be, once they're flowing, let's bring some different perspectives in. So this is where we're gonna have the three groups. We're gonna start with a group looking at our environment, second, we'll look at our um, economy, and then finally community. And then we will begin this journey by doing another set of table exercises. So those are gonna be the three basic pieces of the day. So in terms of setting the stage for all that, I'd like to talk about what I believe is the most visionary vision statement in America, and that is the vision statement of the comp plan of the town of Jackson in Teton County. It's 21 words long, and they're the first words you encounter in the plan. And the first six are really the essence of what, the comp plan, of what we're trying to do. It's the essence of our vision. It's pretty simple. Preserve and protect the area's ecosystem. And the 15, final 15 words are the rationale. In order to ensure a healthy environment, community, and economy for current and future generations. So our, 10 years ago, we decided as a community, after a lot of work, how many years of work, Mark, on getting to that? Like, the best years of your life, yeah. Um, the, uh, we decided that if we preserve and protect the area's ecosystem, then good things would happen, not just for us, but for future generations as well. So, and if you look at that, they're really the three foci. We say we want to help the environment. Well, we sit at the heart of the greatest generally intact ecosystem in the lower 48. We say we want a healthy community. That's a hard thing to evaluate, but I can tell you that we're in the top 1% and perhaps even the top one half of 1% in terms of adults with a bachelor degree or better. And then in terms of an economy, the simple fact is that for about 15 years now, we've had the highest per capita income of any county in America. We, have, we are the wealthiest county and the wealthiest country in the history of the world. There may be a problem, though, and the problem is one of history. If you go back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution 250 years ago, to the best of my knowledge, and I've studied this, and if anybody can tell me where I'm wrong, I, I can't tell you how much I'm dying to learn it. But 250 years, I believe that Teton County, the Tetons region, is the only place in that 250 years 
that has a successful industrial or post-industrial economy, while at the same time having a generally functioning healthy ecosystem. So there's 250 years of precedent that suggest that we are not going to be able to do what we say we want to do in our vision statement, preserve and protect the area's ecosystem. So if you break that down, that challenge down a little bit, I would argue that we have a special challenge and there a unique challenge. And the special challenge is this, that due to changes in technology, every desirable place in the world, small, big, doesn't matter where it is, but every desirable place to live is undergoing the same sort of fundamental suite of problems that we are right now. The most prominent of which being affordable housing, transportation infrastructure that seems to be not working very well, and growing income inequality. But when we adopted that vision statement, we also took on a unique challenge. The challenge is trying to buck the 250 year precedent. And that challenge is we also want to preserve and protect our ecosystem. So we've got an extraordinary suite of challenges that everybody else is facing and hasn't figured out, plus one that nobody in 250 years has figured out. So are we vulnerable to that, or are we going to be the exception? I think that's really the question and the balance. And if you start looking for signs to the negative, well, I can point to a couple. For example, on their environment. We're the headwaters of the Snake River watershed, yet we have impaired streams, we have polluted groundwater, and if you view water as I do as the canary in the coal mine about environmental problems, then we have reason to be concerned. Do we have a healthy community? Again, as I said, it's hard to judge, but I do know that we have school kids sleeping in cars. Is that a sign of healthy community? I don't know. Uh, and then as far as a healthy economy, we not only have the highest per capita income of any county in America, we also have the greatest income inequality. So, I'm not here to pass judgment, but what I am here to say is I don't believe that we can continue taking the bounty of our place, of our community, of our region for granted any longer. I think that there are enough warning signs out there about problems in all of these areas, environment, community, economy, that suggest that the way we've been approaching things perhaps isn't working. And that's really the question that I hope we can tackle today. Is what we're doing working? And if so, is it taking us in the direction we want to go? So, in particular, my concern is that the pace of growth and change that's sweeping into our community, into our region, is accelerating a path at a pace that may be overwhelming us. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that using some data that just came out from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. And the, the lens I'm going to offer up to you is that of a location-dependent economy versus a location-neutral. Um, historically, our geographic isolation has sort of been our saving grace. It's really defined what we are, who we are, how we earn our livings. Those of us who've lived here for a while know that when we moved here, we, a lot of us made sacrifices to be here. We moved away from family, from friends, from perhaps income and job opportunities, uh, social and cultural opportunities, those kinds of things. But as technology has changed over the last few years, that geographic isolation has come to matter less. And so there's all sorts of technologies that are changing our lives. The fact that we could sit here, we couldn't have done that presentation like this 20 years ago. And location neutral businesses are on the rise. And here's what the data are telling us. So I'm gonna look at, these next few slides are gonna look at, the, at um, our economy, wages, jobs, and the like, through the lens of location dependent versus location independent. Uh, and I forgot to make a point here that's really important. Location-dependent businesses, think of tourism in particular, they have a very different business model than do location-neutral ones. If you're gonna run a successful tourism business, you generally need a lot of employees. You probably are not paying them huge wages. Um, and in order for that to work, you have to have low-priced land. And until the mid-1980s or so, there was a rough balance between our wages and our housing prices. But over the last 30 years, as um, technology has broken down those geographic barriers, 
we've had more location neutral business come in and that there's become an increasing disconnect. So if we look at the BLS data, this first slide here is going to look at total employees. So they go back as far as 2001 and what you can see on the left hand side is the number of jobs by job type. So the gray is location dependent. The fuchsia is location independent. There really hasn't been much change over the last 21 years. So now let's look at the number of employers. Whoa. So in 2001, roughly 70% of all jobs were, or all businesses were location dependent. Construction, tourism, and the like. And only about a quarter, 30% were independent. Today, it's pushing closer to 50-50. Now let's look at wages. I mentioned a different, fundamentally different type of structure. This is total wages. So in the course of 21 years, we've gone from a place where three quarters of our wages were being generated or paid by businesses in the location dependent industries to a place where it's pushing 50-50 now. And then finally, and it's going to change the format from a pie graph to a bar graph, I'm going to look at average wage. So the gray bar is the average wage in a location dependent. The green is overall wages. And the fuchsia is independent, location independent. And as the little caption says up at the top, the, and what, makes, what the bars make clear is how it's changed. So now I just want to walk you through a little bit more granularity in that. So this goes back to 2010. And this is the main categories of industries. The gray bars, again, are location dependent. The green is the overall average. And the fuchsia are location independent. And for me, what jumps out of this graph is really there's not a whole lot of difference. We're going to skip ahead two years. Not much change. Same basic shape. Just squint, what do you see? Jump ahead two years, education and health, the one right above the green has jumped up, but it's still pretty much the same, 2014 to 2016, pretty much the same. 2016 to 2018, pretty much the same. 2018 to 2020. Each of the bars is moving to the right a little, but it's still the same basic relationship. And, but the reason that I ask you to look at this is this is two years ago, right? This is the last quarter, COVID hit right at the end. Now here's the situation three months ago during the first, or six months ago during the first quarter. So I'm gonna go back, this is 2020. You can see that two of the five bars below the green are location dependent. But the quick rush, the huge rush of jobs of employers into the location neutral space has completely changed our wages. It's completely changed. And this slide right here, so this, the graph on the left shows the number of businesses and that sort of scar, excuse me, the uh, aqua line shows 2020. And the one on the right shows the wages, location independent versus location um, dependent. So, the reason I wanted to talk to you about this and use this to set the stage is for those of you who are s sensing anxiety or a sense that things are really changing quickly, I would argue to you that you see on the screen in front of you evidence that they are. For those of you who are concerned about whether your business is going to be able to continue to pay competitive wages and whether it feels like things are running away rapidly, you're not crazy. The data are becoming pretty compelling, and I've looked at other counties in the Mountain West as well, and the same general trend is happening here. So, point being, things are happening, they're happening very quickly, and they're happening in a way that um, I think is pretty powerful. So, change is happening, it's going to happen, and the question is, can we harness it, can we identify it, can we bring it in the direction that we want to bring it? So, the focus that I would ask you to bring to some of your conversations are the three basic questions of strategic planning. Where are we? Where do we want to be? How do we get there? We're not going to try to answer the third question today. We're not really sure where we are in 
in many of the ways in the first, but we're very clear about where we want to be. So the question is, how are we going to start getting from where we are to how we want to be? And do we really understand that well? Because I would argue to you that if we don't really understand the problem clearly and well, then we're going to have a very difficult time of addressing it effectively. You have to be able to diagnose it properly. St. John's Health, that's what you do. You guys diagnose things before you treat them. That's a powerful, powerful metaphor for all of the challenges and all of the opportunities that we face as a community. So, the first step is clarity. Um, the clearer we are about our goals, we set some very clear goals, but I think the next step is asking ourselves, what is a healthy community? What is a healthy environment? What is a healthy economy? That's the challenge that we face, because until we can start asking those questions, defining those questions, and then measuring progress toward them, I think we're going to have a hard time fighting back against that 250-year precedent. So, the task today is to start answering the, or start exploring those questions of a healthy environment, healthy community, healthy economy. And I firmly believe that together we can do this. No one of us, no one body, no one business is bright enough to figure it out. But we have so much passion and we have so much talent and we have so many resources that we can bring to this that I think we can fight that 250 year precedent. We can bucket together. So, before breaking into the, into the last uh, piece, I, I do want to make two acknowledgements. Um, and one is, the first is that it's Yom Kippur. And I scheduled this event um, on Yom Kippur without realizing what I was doing. And when I found out that it is the holiest day in Judaism, I, I knew it was the holiest day. I did not realize that today was it, the Day of Atonement, the holiest day. And because of that, some of our uh, members of the community who are Jews have chosen not to come. Uh, that was my bad. I feel horrible about it. And I just want to acknowledge that. And the second thing I want to do is acknowledge, the, the, read a, a statement about the fact that these are native lands. Um, and I got some help in writing this, but I think it's, it's important to share. So if you'll excuse me, I'm going to pull out glasses because I want to get it right. The land on which we gather is the ancestral homelands of the mountain Shoshone people who have stewarded this land for thousands of years. Many other tribes have also lived upon and cared for this area, including the Kiowa, Lakota, Cheyenne, Bannock, Nez Perce, Crow, Blackfeet, and Grovant. We thank and honor them for their enduring strength and their resilience in protecting this land, and we aspire to follow their example as we uphold our stewardship responsibilities. We also would like to recognize that these lands originally belonged to others and, was in many and were in many cases taken from the indigenous inhabitants in ways repugnant to our standards to which we hold ourselves today. We would like to recognize that the mountain Shoshone term for Teton mountain range is Tiwanak, a word describing the range's many pinnacles. And we also recognize that, as with any words, this acknowledgement only becomes wholly meaningful when combined with accountable relationships and informed actions. Acknowledgements are necessary, but they're far from sufficient. So thank you. So with that, what I would ask you to do is gather in tables. It's probably going to work to have at least, we set up the tables for six, because ideally there'd be five or six people to a table. But what I'd like you to do is answer, just talk about two questions, do some self-introductions, and then talk about two things. If you look 10 years from now, Ideally, what are the qualities that will describe this community to you? What are we going to be like in your perfect world? And then I would ask everybody to talk about what do you think it's going to be? Is there, are, are we going in the direction you'd like us to see go? Or are we going in another direction? And if so, to what degree can you define where things are going and not? So let's take about 25, 30 minutes. And at the end of that, I'm going to come around with a microphone and we'll do a quick one minute summary. And what I would ask somebody to do at every table is scribe. If you want to go um, old school, there's pen and pencil at every, or pen and paper at every table. But what I'd like to do is gather all of this information at the end and share it, just as at the end of the other table exercise, I'm going to share that as well, and use this as a foundation for building. 
So it's about 10 to 35 right now. We're running a little bit late, but that's fine. So let's take 25, 30 minutes, and if you would, as a group, as a table, talk about these questions. Where do you think we are going, and where would you like us to be going? How do you see the differences? Thank you very much, and again, thank you so very much for coming. I just can't thank you enough.